so good to see you again. Welcome back to the Gallery of Curiosities. I remain, as always, your humble host, Osgood. You will never believe what I found this week while making my rounds of the local estate sales. Here, see if you can guess what this is. Looks a bit like a large dog cage, doesn't it? Except too long, and see how the bottom panel on the cage is raised and hung with springs? Yes, like an old army bed. It does look like a small mattress could fit in there. Any idea what it is? No? This, my friends, is a Morrison shelter. They were used during the London Blitz as an in-home bomb shelter. You might recall seeing actress Anne-Margaret cowering inside of one during the air raid sequence in the film Tommy. It could fit two adults with a small child, albeit quite snugly, or perhaps just the children. Children being much smaller in those days. War rationing, you see. Two decades later, the twiggy look would be all the rage in swinging London. Not a coincidence. Well, Kevin has been asking for one in his own room. I'm not exactly sure why, but this should do nicely, I think. While I clean this out, why don't you busy yourself with this evening's exhibit, which comes to us from author Suzanne J. Willis. A Melbourne, Australia-based writer, a graduate of Clarion South, and an Aurorealis Award finalist. Her stories have appeared in anthologies by P.S. Publishing, Prime Books, Falstaff Books, and in Syntax and Salt, Mythic Delirium, and Lackington's. Ms. Willis's tales are inspired by fairy tales, ghost stories, and all things strange. She can be found online at suzannejwillis.webs.com. Year of the Teacup Dragon by Suzanne J. Willis It was the year of the Blitz when air raid sirens sounded throughout London, and the nights brought something more terrible than the ordinary monsters of childhood. It was the year that the plum tree began to fruit, and I learned how to preserve the pears and apples from our old trees to use throughout the winter. And in March of that year, among the things that quickly became ordinary, I discovered something that would change me forever. It was the year of the teacup dragon. It was an early spring day when my mother took me walking through the woods that backed onto our row of houses. Snow lay among the roots of the trees, which were starting to bud under the grey skies. But the day was warm enough and Mum was happy to be out and about, even though she and I had been awake long into the night, waiting for Dad to come home from his home guard duties. It was always like that in those days. We lay awake waiting for him ever since the day we found out my older brother, Albert, wouldn't be coming home at all. On the nights we didn't have to run to the shelter, that is. Dad didn't want us out walking too far from the shelters, but Mum couldn't stand being cooped up, she said, in that way of hers that made Dad silent and raised his eyebrows in response. They had a way of speaking to one another without words, it seemed. Even more so since we got the telegram about Albert. They never mentioned him to me, but sometimes I would hear them whispering, in the way that people do when they're trying to keep something tucked away, tight inside, scared to let it loose. I trailed behind Mum, listening to the birds and trying to catch sight of the first proper greenery of the season. In the verdant shadows off the path, a fiery flash caught my eye. I walked towards the huge oak tree, the cuckoo was hopping about and pecking at the ground as the green flames flashed. There, at the base of the tree among shards of eggshell, lay a tiny dragon, scales the colour of violets, Mum's favourite flower, beating its leathery wings against the cuckoo's attack, its poisonous fire burning dangerously near the leaf litter and bark. I knew that dragons weren't supposed to exist, that they were something in storybooks and imagination, but I also knew enough tales about the fae and the strange superstitions that people had to have always known the dragons were possible. 
I knew enough to trust that it was a real dragon, newborn and fighting for its life. It looked like the bird was winning, the dragon's wing so wet that it was unable to fly. With every flame, the snow around it melted, making it even harder for the little creature, that the cuckoo dived toward it, beak and claws cruelly sharp. Dad hated cuckoos. Nasty things, he'd say. So I wasn't too fond of them either. I ran towards it and flapped my arms, maybe a little hysterically. Squawking, it swiped my head with its wings and flew off into the darkness of the woods. I crept closer to the dragon, now resting its head between its front paws and breathing heavily, like a dog come in from a long run. I reached out toward it, then stopped. The sparks flew out its nostrils. I'm not going to hurt you, I said sitting down and resting my hand, palm up, in the mulch to stop it from trembling. The dragon looked at me with a rather suspicious expression. At least the sparks stopped. It stretched and flapped its damp, viscous wings. Scylla? Mum would worry if I was away from her for too long. I have to go. Something rustled in the trees, a something that sounded a lot like an angry cuckoo. Come with me. I don't think you'll be safe here, but I can help you. I reached out my hand a little further, wondering what Mum and Dad would say if I did bring it home. The dragon seemed to be sizing me up, then stood, shook itself off, and climbed into my palm. But Mum, it was the dragon, and not fibbing. Things had not gone so well in the two days since I found the troublesome creature. How could such a tiny thing wreak so much havoc? My little bedroom had not fared much better than our city under attack from the German bombs. The roof of the dollhouse that had made me was nibbled and gnawed at the edges, and the dragon's sharp teeth had taken chunks out of the soft wood. Two of my cloth and peg dolls were shredded beyond recognition by his curious claws. His most recent unruly behavior was to fly around the room, just out of my reach, and breathe fire onto my school books. Mum stood in the doorway, looking at the smoldering, ruined pages over which I had thrown my cup of tea in a desperate attempt to extinguish the flames. For the love of God, Scylla, you expect me to believe that a lizard did all this? I said nothing, just pursed my lips and looked at the ground, stamping my feet at the injustice. That was the other problem I had. No one actually believed it was a dragon. When I had run to Mum in the woods and opened my hand, he lay there with his wings tucked away and scales gone metal grey, with nary a flame to be seen. He had since developed the convenient habit of hiding whenever anyone else was about to catch sight of him. I don't know where you got the matches or why you would decide to set fire to your school books, for goodness sake. But you'll put them in your satchel, take them straight to Miss White's. No, it won't wait until school on Monday, and explain what you've done. I opened my mouth, but no words came out. She really was so terribly cross with me that she would let me go out by myself. Something she hadn't allowed since Albert's telegram. She turned on her heel and left. I began to pack the books into my satchel, brushing away the thought that Albert would have seen my dragon even if the dragon had hidden. Albert would have believed me. But I tried not to think about him too much in those days. Everyone, it seemed, had a brother or an uncle or a father who was gone forever, and it didn't seem right to dwell too much. There was a puffing cough from the top of the bookcase. The dragon looked down at me, head cocked to one side, and violet scales gleaming in the afternoon light. He, at least, had the good grace to look embarrassed. I buttoned the satchel and held out my hand. I don't think it will do much good to leave you here to your own devices, I said. He spread his wings and glided down, looping twice around my head, then landed in my hand. Show off, I muttered, slipping him into my pocket. As I left the house, he began to gently snore, he could, I had to admit to myself, be incredibly charming when he was asleep. In the wan sunlight, 
the streets looked as they always had. The bombs had come close to us, but hadn't yet ravaged our little patch of London. At the end of our street, I turned left and walked up the hill, past the butcher, the seamstress, and the tea rooms, where Vera Lynn sung, We'll Meet Again, and the speakers of the radiogram. I stopped for a moment, letting the song wash over me, closing my eyes to the sunlight and dreaming about the cakes that the tea room used to sell before rationing. My mouth watered, and I sighed, opening my eyes. Miss White's bookshop was in the next block, no more than a minute or so's walk. She was a very particular woman who was known to have conniptions if she saw someone leave a book open face down. I shuddered to think what she would do when she saw the damage the dragon had done to my school books. Worse still was the thought of what Mum would do to me if I came back without having seen Miss White. Squaring my shoulders, I walked towards the bookshop. Ow! I wasn't more than half a dozen steps away from Miss White's door, and the dragon dug his claws into my leg, like a cat impatient for food. I opened my pocket and looked in. That hurt! What we are putting those talons, if you don't mind? I began walking again. Again, he dug his claws in, this time hard enough to stop me in my tracks. If you don't stop that, I hissed down at him, I'll leave you here to fend for yourself, and then where would you be? But something was wrong. The dragon was whimpering softly, a distressed sound accompanied by wisps of smoke from his flaring nostrils. I couldn't help but feel sorry for him. I sat on a nearby stoop and took him from my pocket. He wouldn't settle, even though I stroked his head and scratched under his chin. This was different to the rascal who had ruined my room and gotten me into trouble. He was genuinely scared. It frightened me, so much so that I didn't hear the droning until it was loud enough to be its own warning, without the wail of the air raid siren that followed it a few seconds later. From far above, I heard a whistling. The day was in slow motion, as though I was underwater or in a dream. Mothers were running past me, carrying their children, pulling them along by the hand, towards the public air raid shelter. The butcher, his blue and white apron flapping around his ankles, puffed past as well. I didn't move. I couldn't. Then there was Miss White, scooping me up in her arms and running, running as I buried my head in her shoulder. We were a step or two inside the shelter when we felt the tremendous shake and shock as the bombs hit. Miss White gripped my shoulders tightly as the ground rumbled again. Then another. And another. My shaking went on for what seemed like the longest time. No one spoke or cried. There was silence and the awful pause of waiting, with everyone holding their breath. My stomach knotted as I thought about Mum. Then I wriggled at Mrs. White's arms, anxious to get back to her. But Miss White held me tight. The sirens continued to wail, and the shelter smelled musty and stale, like our house did when we closed up over the damp winter. Crisps? Old Mr. Potts pulled a few packets from a shopping bag and passed them around seemingly unperturbed, as he sat there in his tin helmet. Some people munched, and the other children started to chatter among themselves, but all I could think of was getting back to Mum. Miss White loosened her grip a little, and I remembered my dragon, who may very well have saved me with his distress of the impending bombs. I put my hand in my pocket, as much to comfort him as myself. It was empty. I shook my head as the crisps came my way, trying hard not to fidget in my agitation. I wouldn't think of him under the rubble or caught in one of the ground-shaking explosions. The ground stopped shaking and the enormous catastrophic sounds of dropping bombs ceased, but it was another ten minutes before the all-clear siren sounded. Mr. Potts, his helmet slightly askew, opened the door and I rushed out into the dust and rubble. What used to be a row of shops was now a pile of broken bricks and smouldering ruins. A row of houses in Gloucestershire Lane had met the same fate. The air was smoky, choking. 
the silence was broken by shouts and a strangled cry from Miss White as she rushed over to where the bookshop once stood, frantically plucking at books that had somehow, miraculously, survived. I stood in my tiny, broken world and wondered why. Somewhere through the smoke, Mum was calling me, over and over. Scylla! Where's my Scylla? She ran up the hill towards me, tears streaking the dust on her cheeks. Until that day, I had never seen her cry. We grabbed one another, then she stood back and felt my head, my arms, my legs and feet. Surprisingly, she laughed aloud, but the other people turned and stared. My mother had a loud, rash laugh, and it cut across the stunned whispers and cries that drifted through the air. Not a scratch. I sent you out there, and I could never, never have forgiven myself. It's all right, Mum. It was Miss White who helped me at her in the... My voice caught in my throat, the thought of my dragon. My mum straightened up and, taking my hand, walked over to Miss White and put her arm around her. She lived at the back of that shop, and now there was nothing except a few damaged books and a crater where her home used to be. They spoke in soft voices, and Miss White sniffled once, twice, then stood tall, smiling grimly. Jerry, you'll know get the best of us, she said. I'll take you up on your kind offer to stay, but I'll be rebuilding here, mark my words. Is that not right, young Scylla? She winked at me, clutching the books tight to her chest. I couldn't imagine how anyone could rebuild from that. It looked as though there had never been any shops there at all, but I couldn't imagine the world always being like this either. Everyone always tense and waiting for the sirens, then waiting for the bombs that followed rationing sugar and tea and the food that could make you feel properly full. Not knowing when, if, the people you loved were coming home again. Not getting the chance to properly love something you had only recently discovered, like a tiny dragon who had saved my life. But I swallowed my tears and straightened my shoulders too. I would be like Mum and Miss White, not letting anything get the best of me. We turned the corner, and there was our home, nestled between its neighbours as though to keep out the cold, with not a scratch on it. Mum put the kettle on the hob as Miss White helped the cups in the milk jug. And where's your cup, Scylla? Only a few hours ago, I had used it to put out dragon fire, burning my books. I ran upstairs to retrieve it. My bedroom window was ajar, early spring breezing through it and clearing the last smell of burnt paper from the room. On my bedside table was the cup and saucer, my favourite, white patterned with yellow flowers. Oh, inside the cup, curled up as though it had been made for him, was my dragon. He opened his eyes lazily as I smiled at him. You're a teacup, dragon. Giving him a name to make him properly mine, just as this awful day had made me his. Downstairs, the kettle whistled, and Mum laughed her brashest best at something Miss White had said. An afternoon that had tea and dragons and a happy Mum spoke a possibility in a world of loss. Of a world that might turn out well, after all. Once he had claimed the teacup for his very own, my dragon stopped wreaking havoc at home, Quite a sensible dragon, I thought, to choose a teacup as his comfortable spot. Tea is, after all, one of the most comforting things in life. The first thing the neighbours did, after the telegram boy delivered the news about Albert, was to make mum and dad cups of hot, sweet tea. For the shock, they said. And ever since I had been little, mum had always made me a cup of weak, milky tea, which made a pot for herself and dad. But while he calmed down at home, the same couldn't be said for his conduct outside it. Although he never grew any bigger, I could tell that he was growing up, getting older. His skin lost its soft, lizardy texture, and his scales became hard, like tiny jewels laid in an old mosaic brooch. When Mum and I went back to the woods, the bluebells and the snowdrops thick on the ground, the violets making Mum smile, I took him with me, deliberately lagging behind a little. 
I took him from my pocket and he stretched his wings. They had lost their delicate translucence, their pattern of fine veins instead becoming tough, substantial. Wings that were made to soar. The teacup dragon snuffed his snout into my hand, and I gave him a little prod. He took off, circling into the green canopy above. The sound of his flight followed me. The circle of bright light shafted through the canopy as the dragon burst through it into the sky above. Then a fearsome wind began, squalling through the treetops, nearly knocking us over. Mum looked shocked as leaves twirled around us and birds squawked in their nests. But I knew that it could only be the beating of a teacup dragon's wings that would cause such a fuss. I shut my eyes and could almost imagine they were my wings, beating fiercely under the wide sky. So I began to let him out on some nights, to fly freely, and do the sorts of secret things that dragons must do when they are alone. The morning after the first such night, a squeal from Mrs. Granger next door and the smash of her milk bottles on the front porch interrupted our breakfast. Something small and charred lay beyond her doorstep, still smoking. Mum rushed over to Mrs. Granger, who was heavily pregnant, muttering about neighborhood louts. It looks like a cuckoo, Mum said. Who would do such a thing? I knew very well who. I thought about my teacup dragon, who made me laugh with his smoky snuffles, and sat on my shoulder while I read books, who perched on the windowsill next to me when I stared up at the full moon, and looked thoughtful when I asked him where its silver path might lead whose presence made me feel safe in an unsafe world. But when the charred cuckoos began turning up all over the neighborhood, I knew then that, as much as I had grown to love him, my teacup dragon was vengeful, and I couldn't be sure that was a good thing or not. Do you believe in dragons, Miss White? I asked over dinner. It was me and Mum and Miss White as Dad was off on home guard duties again. We sat around the table, the lamps low, and the windows blacked out. A pet dragon is his convenient excuse for things going wrong, Mum said. She passed potatoes to our guest. I frowned and opened my mouth to protest. Well now, Scylla, began Miss White, smiling at me and Mum. It so happens that I do believe in dragons, and fairies, the ones who will offer you poisoned apples or trick you into going under the mountain, and all sorts of creatures that perhaps other grown-ups might think of as silly. Why do you ask? You see, I was wondering if, even though a dragon might be tiny, he could also be dangerous. Mom and her eyes at me in a what now sort of look, but Miss White laid down her knife and fork and leaned towards me. Size is no measure of strength. Some of the world's most powerful, most wicked of men have been small. But whether someone or something is dangerous or not, well, it all comes down to intentions, my girl. This dragon of yours, good or no? Mum kept eating, but I knew she was listening. Once, she would have talked to me about my dragon, even if she did see a lizard when she looked at it. But... That was before sadness filled her up and left no room for such things. I think he's a bit like me, Miss White. I always tried to be good, but sometimes things don't work out the way that they're meant to. Just life, Mum said softly. Just like it, Miss White agreed. Miss White and Mum had both gone to bed. I could hear Miss White's soft snores from Albert's old room, but I was awake with my dragon. I was glad that he hadn't flown off through the window when I'd cracked it open for him earlier, not just because the cuckoos had begun to fray everyone's nerves, but because I missed him when he wasn't there. I wonder where you came from, I said to him in the darkness as I cradled the teacup on my lap and scratched his head as he rested his chin on the rim. I heard him yawn, a growling sound with a sulfurous smell of matches. Miss White believed in you, you know, and fairies. Maybe you know fairies too. He stood on his strong little legs and breathed out green and amber sparks. Slowly, he stretched his wings and beat them softly, reminding me of the cabbage moths that had made a home in our fruit trees. 
The sparks glittered to life, flitting and dancing about in a waltz-like rhythm. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. Dancing in the darkness as though my very own fairies had been hiding inside his smoky belly all along. I put my forehead close to his, and in that quiet moment, it was as though the fairy glimmers lived inside me, too, giving me a life beyond the war and a family missing its only son. A loud knock came at the front door, and the embers faded. Bedroom doors opened and footsteps shuffled in the hallway. I poked my head out my door but was waved away, so I waited until Miss White and Mum had headed downstairs, popped the dragon in my pocket of my dressing gown, and followed, watching from the stair landing. When they opened the door, there was Mrs. Granger, holding her back and groaning. Mum and Miss White helped her inside, and Mum said, Best get the midwife. It's her time. They helped her onto the edges of a chair, rubbing her back and making soothing noises. Miss White picked up the telephone and dialed, frowning, as she listened to the midwife's response to her request. Now, would you like to repeat to me why you're no be coming to birth this barn? Mrs. White's tone was dark. She nodded, then slammed down the phone and turned to Mum. Midwife says she won't be coming out tonight, seeing as she's just washed her hair. She what? laughed Mrs. Granger. Shh. It'll be fine. It'll be apples. I've birthed two of my own, and there's not much that Louise here doesn't know. Mum sounded so sure, but I saw a look pass between her and Miss White. I began to creep back upstairs, as the familiar screech of the air raid siren sounded through the streets. Mrs. Granger swore, and Mum called my name. I ran down the stairs as Miss White took her coat off the hook. I'll take her to the shelter, she said. You'll do no such thing, Mum said. We can't move poor Edwina here, and she'll need us both. Scylla will stay right here in this house with me. She had a look on her face like she did when she first told Dad that she would wear trousers to the village any time she pleased. Miss White put down her coat and pursed her lips. Mum smiled at me. Now, just this once, you can go and sleep in the Morrison shelter in the back room. Go on now. The back room was dark as I crawled through the entrance to the shelter. Its metal top reminded me of a table, and the side mesh was narrow enough to stop anything from raining down on me. At least, I hoped that was the case. As I hunkered down in the corner, the air raid siren, Mrs. Granger crying, and the darkness all weighed down on me. I took my dragon from my pocket and held him close. He reached up and gently licked my face. I was crying. It was the most alone I had ever felt. The planes were coming for us. Dad was goodness knows where with the home guard. They were coming for him, too. Perhaps they would get him, and not us, or the other way around. There was already a big hole in our family where Albert used to be, bigger than any bomb crater. The droning got louder, and my breath caught in my chest. I didn't think we could stand any more loss. The shelter felt flimsy, insubstantial, unable to stop me being hurt and too far away from the people I loved to help them at all. The dragon growled, and I wished I could be brave like him in the face of this danger. Those planes, I whispered, are coming for us, like the cuckoo that came for you, but there's nothing I can do. He looked at me, a serious look on his scaly face. Could you? I thought the beating of wings above the wooded canopy, and the fierceness that lived in my teacup dragon's heart. Would you go out and make us safe? Faster than I could move, he glided from my hand toward the back door. As I fumbled with the entrance to the shelter, he lifted the door latch with his snout and flew out into the awful, dangerous night. The moment he disappeared into the darkness, I wished I had never asked that of him. My cries were lost under the siren and the sound of bombs dropping too nearby. Although I knew I shouldn't, I crawled over to the door, held it open a crack, and peered out hoping to catch a glimpse of him, to call him back. But there was no sign of him. Be careful what you wish for. Mum was always saying to me. I had sent my teacup dragon away. The sky was bright with moonlight, the flashes of anti-aircraft fire. Planes were coming closer. Far away, bombs whistled menacingly. Soon, they would be dropping on us. Then, against the moonlit sky, an enormous shadow reared 
bigger than any plain. It was dragon-shaped and filled the sky, fierce and wondrous. It became solid, scales gleaming dark violet, black, its wingspan dwarfing the moon. It loomed over the plains, and I wondered if those pilots knew they were being hunted. Flashes like gunfire cracked and exploded against the darkness. The shadow dragon was knocked backward, and its left wing was hit by gunfire. But it held its position, beating its wounded wings and hovering like an approaching storm. From the shadow dragon's mouth, green-black fire, so bright, I had to shield my eyes. A roaring wind and heat made me shut the door. Although the sirens kept wailing, the droning noise of the planes had disappeared. I kept watch my dragon to return. Had he called the monster that had saved us? Or was he the monster? One that I knew lived inside him, fierce and untamed. After what seemed like forever, the all-clear siren sounded, and the night was quiet again, as soft grey ash fell from the sky like summer rain. Scylla, time to hop up. It was morning, and Mum was smiling at me as she shook me awake. Someone must have carried me to my room and tucked me in. Mum seemed happier than I had seen her in a long while, and she chatted away. Mrs. Granger had her babe last night. She's resting up now, but you can meet the little one later on. Oh, here's your cup. I'll take it downstairs. She made a face and put it down again. Your lizard seems to have made a home in there. It looks a little peaky, to be honest. I jumped up as Mum left the room. He'd found his way back. My dragon was curled inside the cup, but he didn't look well at all. He was breathing heavily, and his left wing was tattered. All the same, he lifted his head, and I scratched softly under his chin. I swallowed back my tears as I remembered seeing the planes fire at the Shadow Dragon last night, hitting its wing. Thank you. You were magnificent. In return... He puffed a wisp or two of smoke and nuzzled my wrist, then curled up and slept. I put the cup in his favorite sunny spot on the windowsill and hoped that I could find a way to fix his wing. The sun glittered on his scales, throwing ripples of indigo light onto the window frame and ceiling. Miss White had been right. Even something as little as my dragon could hold a sky full of goodness and bravery inside him. As I walked out into the hallway, the sound of cracking and flames filled the morning. I raced back into my room, Mum and Miss White rushing up the stairs behind me. No! White and orange flames crackled and spat from the teacup, roaring like a fire in a hearth. The room smelled of burning sage, rosemary, then the freshness of wild mint. As quickly as it had flared, the fire died. I raced over to the windowsill, too shocked to cry. In the clearing smoke, my yellow rose teacup was unharmed. Inside, on a soft bed of ash, lay a pale lavender egg, bigger than a robin's, not quite as big as a chicken's. The egg was warm to the touch. I held it up to the light, and the sun shone through the shell. It was like looking through a quick-flowing stream, trying to make out the creatures hiding at the bottom. Like a tiny fish emerging from the shadows, a shape unfurled inside, no bigger than a thumbnail. I turned this way, a glimpse of dragonish snout, that way, a delicately unfurling wing. Mum and Miss White were whispering behind me, and I felt Mum's hands on my shoulders. The heart of loving something, she said, is knowing when it's time to let go. I clenched my teeth, wanting to take the egg and run away, hide with it in the woods beyond. It was my fault that he was injured, my fault that he was leaving as suddenly as he came. Can't I keep him? Dragons are fire creatures, said Miss White. Like the phoenix, dying by fire and being reborn from the ashes. A new creature, created from the old. Familiar and unfamiliar all the same. I thought I understood, but my chest was heavy and I was lightheaded. So my teacup dragon is gone for good? Once I would have cried. But if he could be brave, so could I. So instead, I put the egg back in the cup, and together with Mum, walked back to the woods. We found a thick patch of violets near a hollow moss-covered log. 
I placed the egg carefully inside the log, so it was sheltered from any predators. Do you think he will be all right? I think he's a lot like you, dearest. He will be fine. I tucked moss around the egg, then kissed my fingertips and pressed it to the shell, like Mum did when she said goodnight. Another dragon would hatch in his place, and he would do the things he was meant to do, before a magical fire encased him in an egg, and he began life all over again. I wondered if he would remember me, and all the lifetimes that he might have, for all the years stretching ahead of him. I wondered if he would remember that he had saved us. That was the year that Mum and Dad began to speak to me of Albert again, and the year Miss White sold books in the rubble of her ruined shop. A year of ordinary miracles, in which a baby was born in our house in the midst of an air raid. A year in which I learned about double-edged wishes, and that losses walk hand in hand with bravery. It was the year of the teacup dragon. This evening's narrator Byrony is a twenty-something Londoner who has loved stories in all forms for her entire life. This love has led to a master's degree in English literature and a decade-long hobby of narration and performance. She teaches English and maths, and her biggest dream is to successfully land a salcho jump in figure skating. Well, the hour is late and I still have much to clean here, so you should be on your way. But do visit us next time at the Gallery of Curiosities. Gallery of Curiosities is produced under a Creative Commons International 4.0 Non-Commercial Attribution No Derivatives License. All story copyrights remain with the authors. Our theme song is Ashes Ashes by Deus Ex Vapora Machina. If you enjoy the show, share it with your friends and leave stars and reviews online. This episode was produced in August of 2019. For full show notes, visit us on the web at gallerycurious.com.